Hey everyone, welcome to May 27th. Uh, wait, I think it's July 30th. Um, so we usually start out each month and go around the room and say hello, uh, what we're doing with Java and that kind of stuff. And then after the meetings, we go past the black curtain and uh, continue drinking beer and, and chatting with each other. So. Uh, it's going to be a chance to hear something interesting, uh, start a conversation later on. So we've got a uh, mailing list, a meetup group, which is significantly more reliable than the mailing list for meeting announcements. So definitely join the meetup if you're not on it already. Uh, we have a Google Plus community, although I heard something yesterday about Google Plus being discontinued. So, <laughs> so don't join that. Uh, <laughs> is it Orcut? Are you on Orcut? We, sh we should be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've got videos of most of our meetings. We had a mishap a few months ago. Uh, and last month's meeting, when Donnie gives us the go-ahead, will be up. That was a fun one. Um, and job postings. We had one, a fresh one, that was good local job posting a few days ago. So check out the mailing list if you're looking for that. We get about one out of 100 of those postings comes through, because the other ones are for, like, business objects developers in Texas. <laughs> and other things that are neither Toronto nor Java. Some of them are jobs. But there's only like, <laughs> there's three things that you need to be to get on the list and most of them miss at least two of the three. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're a member of the O'Reilly discount program, so everybody here is welcome to use code PCBW to get discounts on all the O'Reilly books. It's cool. Does that work for the online books, the library? Yes. You get half off. <laughs> Don't forget. You, you paid double. So, Java News. Some things happened. Uh, Java 9, there's, there's going to be a read eval print loop for Java 9 uh, out of the box, which that will be fun. It's always nice to explore new APIs interactively, and this will now be part of the base SDK. So that's cool. Uh, if you look there, there's a video. It's about five minutes long on YouTube that demonstrates the basics of the, the REPL that's coming to Java 9. Is there a simple web server? Do we already have one? There was the simple web server in Java 1.1 or something oh. uh, still there, as far as I know. Um, Go has a simple web server, I found out. You just can't stop it. Yeah. <laughs> you can start it. Um, yeah, Java EE8 is coming. And it's taking shape now. There's been a presentation from one of the Oracle Java EE evangelists that uh, the URL is there, and you can read it for a bit more depth than this on what's coming in Java EE8. Servlet 4 with support for HTTP 2, that will be good. HTTP 2 is a, a big difference from 1.1, which has been with us for a long, long time. Uh, most notably in HTTP 2, the server can send things to the client that the client didn't ask for, which speeds up uh, web page loading because the server can anticipate what the client will ask for and send it ahead of time. Um, this is fully bi-directional communication and it's broken up into frames so you can send more than one thing at a time and all of this is mostly to get around the TCP slow start. And every time you make a new TCP connection it has reduced bandwidth for the first while. Also support ser for server sent events which has been in HTTP for a long time but uh, it'll be sort of first class support in your servlets if you want to dribble data to clients. Um, so the long awaited sequel to the JSON spec that we participated in for the first round in the adopted JSR program is coming. It's um, the whole reason that the last JSON spec was called JSON P, which was a terrible name for it because that already means something. Um, <laughs> The new one is called JSONB, and this is by analogy with uh, JAXP and JAXB. 
But Postgres supports a thing called JSON B with OK Josh. Of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, JSON B has JSON binding, so you can bind your POJOs to JSON just like you do with XML binding, JAXB. So yeah. And uh, JSON pointer and JSON patch are cool. Those are, they have RFCs and they're ways of, they're basically like XPath for JSON. So you have li nice little string expressions for pointing to bits of a JSON document. So that's going to be supported by the new uh, JSON spec in Java EE8. So that's good. There's going, I didn't, oh, okay. I've been on the mailing list because I, I was on the mailing list from the last one and I got auto subscribed to the new one. Uh, they discussed JSON schema, and I don't think they decided to include it in this version of the spec. Hopefully that will come later, because I miss that. I know XML is dumb, and we're supposed to hate it now, but I do miss the sort of validation aspect of XML, because it made the tools be able to know what you wanted to type next. You can't do that. Far too close contract to no contract at all. Yes, exactly. Um, the MVC framework is coming in Java EE8. This has been anticipated for a while. And it's basically gluing together stuff that was already there to give you something that's uh, like JAXRS, but with annotations that let you say what the view will be. And it doesn't have to be a JSP, but that'll be what all the sort of reference implementations are based on. So you get like JAXRS and CDI and beam validation all together, all their annotations will work in the right way. And then you can basically return some sort of domain object, and it will be in the context of the JSP when it gets rendered. So that's a thing. Um, there's also going to, there's an effort to simplify and generalize the security APIs. Generalize meaning that you can use security annotations in a lot more places, which is good. And simplification in that you can make a new security provider with uh, like an annotated POJO that's like, call me before a secure thing happens and it'll like intercept the requests that need to be secured. Um, and you can also annotate methods that do like lookups for users and things like that. So I think it's a big improvement. I did a bit of studying of the existing security APIs about a year ago and they're all very different and in need of unification. So this looks good. And the timeline is public review draft end of this year, so that's coming soon. Still lots of good, this is a, a perfect time to give input on the specs because they're kind of coming together and they're not at their public review stage yet. So suggestions you make and bugs you file against them will probably be acted on before the public review draft. After that, things kind of get a little more cemented. So take a look if you're interested in any of these things. Uh, this is a bit of a remedy to Oracle's policy on Glassfish, which is that you can't buy support anymore. So uh, Dan pointed this one out. It's, do you want to say anything else about it? Or? Uh, just that I tried it and it works so far. <laughs> cool. Uh, haven't, we haven't rolled anything out with it yet, but it's seeming like an easy migration path from uh, our projects that are still on Glassfish 3. Mm -hmm. So it's like a tightened up version of Glassfish that's secure by default and it's still open source, right? And yeah. free to use. And then you can pay them per server per year for support at various quality levels. Is that, a, is that like a, a piranha that's going to take all your money? Or? Yeah, well, it's a piranha, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you OK, so this is kind of in the, in the spirit of Donnie's talk from last month. There was a Java deathmatch website that went up from uh, Takipi, and they had a whole bunch of questions that you could go and uh, sort of answer these multiple choice questions about Java code given a time limit. And this was at the end after, I think they had 60,000 people go through the thing. This question was the one that was answered incorrectly most often. OK. So four out of five people who took the Java deathmatch and finished it got the answer to this one wrong. 
Just give a minute. I think, I think they gave you 30 seconds or 45 seconds to answer on the Java Deathmatch competition. No, one of the answers is correct. I thought it was none of the above. OK, so let's, let's try a show of hands. So option one, compilation fails because no SQL exception is thrown. Sorry. One. No, no, sorry. <laughs> OK, throws class cast exception because SQL exception is not instance of runtime exception. Zero. No problem. The program prints the stack trace of the newly thrown SQL exception. Three and a half. Four. And compilation fails because we cannot cast SQL exception to runtime exception. I'm going to go with two. I'm going to go with the first one. Last one. First one? Yeah. Compilation fails because no SQL exception is thrown. None of the above. Well, it seems that way. I didn't even know you could put a, a generic type variable in a throws clause. So right there, I was already, I didn't know what the answer would be. I never tried doing that before. I don't see why you could throw, I guess. So t does get erased and turn into exception. So there's no runtime type checking problem because it's casting little t to exception. So that one's off the table. Um, so. I believe the answer was no problem. Let's just uh, quickly take a look. The casket's raised. Yeah. Do, do, do. They verified that there's actually the cast gets eliminated by the compiler. And. The correct answer is a compilation fails. So the generic throws tricked the compiler into expecting. Yeah. The compiler was expecting a runtime exception, and SQL exception isn't one of those. So, yeah. For me, that, that means that now that I know I could put a generic type variable in a throws clause, I still won't. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that usually the answer to this, though? Yes, usually. <laughs> so that thing you didn't know you could do, <laughs> keep, keep not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Until you really want to troll your coworkers. Right. <laughs> yes. Especially if you created a type variable called runtime exception. <laughs> So Java Magazine continues to have really good content in it. A uh, favorite of mine uh, was a conversation with John Rose from the May-June issue. So check that out. It's interesting. John Rose joined the Java team at Sun, and his first project was to create um, nested and inner classes in Java 1.1. And he worked on Invoke Dynamic more recently and is now working on value types and a few other things. So really interesting article worth reading. Other things? Yes? Spring Framework 4.2 will be out uh, tomorrow morning. Spring Framework 4.2 tomorrow? Yep. What are the headline features of yes, Spring? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I didn't have time to read. Cool. That was supposed to be today, but they postponed tomorrow. OK. Cool. Spring 4.2. Anything else? Cool. 
So let's move on to Jamil's talk. Did I lie? All good. All good. Okay. Good. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, I work at Pivotal Labs uh, with Jonathan now on the same team. Um, I do Java from time to time if it's possible inside the uh, inside, uh, work and mostly outside I do it. So today, uh, first, if you find that logo somewhere, that avatar, that's probably me online. Cool. Okay. So today's talk, uh, what we will uh, we will be going through, uh, we'll be going through a deep dive into JBIG. Anybody know what's JBIG? Have you used it before? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, we'll create a simple file. It will be a demo, a sample website, and uh, we'll try to integrate Google Analytics and Discuss. Uh, everybody knows Discuss. Cool. Uh, just like to see how can we integrate it with it and then make it. Uh, easy to, uh, to integrate. And then at the end, if we have time, I'll go through a, um, um, how I created a small, a small website with JBIG and uh, how did I utilize it and then how it's being hosted right now. And it's all static. Cool. So uh, JBIG is um, a static uh, site generator. It's all in Java written. Uh, it's like a Jekyll, uh, which is used by GitHub pages. Anybody knows Jekyll? Cool. Uh, so it's basically like Jekyll, and they call it the Jekyll of the JVM, and it's totally written in Java. It was uh, created by Jonathan Bullock, and it's all open source on GitHub. So if you want to have a look, uh, it's all open source. You can, uh, you can go ahead. Um, just very basic installation, you'll download it, put the BIM folder in your path, and uh, it just work out of the box. Uh, you need Java 1.6 and up uh, for it to work, and if you have Homebrew or a GVM, you can just install it with it. Cool. So now, I'll just go directly to the demo. So I'll make it more, a little bit maybe interesting just to do it uh, interactively. So. Where am I? Okay. I'll just move it. Uh, <coughs> uh, is it too small or? Okay. Okay, so now we're on empty folder, and I want to create just a very basic website. So let me check, JBIG is in my path. And it's very simple, so there's very few um, uh, options, and you don't probably don't uh, need more of them. So the first thing I want to do is just initialize it. So I want just to tell JBIG, just initialize a website structure for me, and then let me work with it. So I'll just go ahead and JBIG-I. All good. It will tell me all the structure is done. You can see all those. And I'll just close this for now. And if we take a quick look at the website, at the at this folder structure, it will be like this. So at the beginning, there's assets, content, the property files, and templates. So uh, let me go back just to go here. Nice. Before I go in detail into what each folder does, uh, what does it mean, I'll just launch the website. It JB comes, uh, it has Jetty built in, JB, uh, Jetty server. Uh, so if I want to launch the website, I should be in the same folder. And then I tell it JBIG-S. Uh, actually, sorry, I lied. The first thing I need to do is tell it I bake the website. And I'll go through that uh, a bit in a second. So it will bake it. It will technically it's the, uh, it's merging the templates with the HTML. That's what it's doing right now. Cool, all good. So I go JBake and then dash s serve it. It will start the Jetty server and then it will start it at localhost uh, 808020. 8820. So I'll just go 
and that's the website. It will just create, it has like, this is built in, it has um, bootstrap built in, like a uh, template, default template. If you, we will later know, uh, just go through how to get rid of it if you want. So let's go to the interesting part. Just remove. Okay, so the first folder, whenever we said JBIC create me the folder structure, the uh, website structure, it will create something called assets. And you can think about it if all your CSS files, all your images, <laughs> all your JavaScript, anything that like fonts or any resources that you can think about that is not HTML you will put it in this assets folder. So any structure that you put, JBake will respect it, and it will copy it to the output uh, folder uh, that will be the root of your uh, website. So any structure, it will respect it and copy it. It will not do anything, just copy whatever it has in this assets. And as you can see here, like we have CSS, we have fonts and JavaScript. Now, the content. The content, you will put basically all your HTML uh, files. Let's say if you want to create a page, just you, you will create the page and then you will put the HTML. And we will go into detail of how it will be, into how you will mix that with the templates in a minute. You'll put the HTML and JPEG, it uh, supports HTML. And then if you have ASCII, uh, ASCII doc and Markdown. So if you write any document in Markdown or ASCII, ASCII doc, it will t uh, transform it to HTML, and it has all the CSS for that. So you just write it, and then it will create an HTML page and with the layout that you want. So if you don't like HTML and, or you want something very quick, you just use ASCII doc or Markdown. Uh, JBIC properties, it's some properties about it, we'll all cover it later a bit. And the templates. The templates is uh, the templates folder. So JBIG supports templates, uh, free marker, uh, free marker, time leaf, and groovy. So you can choose any one of any one of them, and it will default to free a free marker. I usually use it because I'm most used to it. Um, so this is like a very quick overview about it. So I'll go detail into the uh, the content and into the templates folder now, and then how to create one and what exactly in the template. So did I miss anything? Nope. Uh, okay, nice. Okay, so let's dive a little bit into the content. So that's the temp folder, that's what we have created till now. So let's go on the template. Uh, JBIC, uh, that's the default one. And let's say about.html. As you can see, there's some metadata at the top, and it's very specific to every page. Um, now, uh, for example, let's say if you want to add a title, and we will talk about how we will integrate it with the template in a bit. You can have a date, you can have a type, and status. The most important stuff here that I would care about is the type and the status. The type, tell it which template to use. So you created a about.html. That's a very nice non-HTML page that we see. You need to tell it which template it will need to integrate itself with. So here you will need to add the type. And the template name is page. The status, if you have it as published, whenever you, G whenever you bake the website, whenever you uh, bake it, it will, uh, it will publish it, it will create it. But if you say, uh, uh, I think if you put anything else, it will not publish it. So let's say if, you, if you're working on any blog or writing something that you don't want it to be published and something else published, just uh, you will change the status. 
Uh, that's the basic one here. So let's see in the template page what does it look like. <coughs> here, very basic template. You, uh, just the syntax, if you don't know it, it's like very, uh, it's specific to free marker, but it should, be, it should be easy, it should be easy to do. So we're just including the header, we're including a header template, which we will see right here. Now this is the default one, I'll just uh, warn you that it's not done well, the mix between HTML and templates. Uh, because for example, if we go this header template, if we go look to the header template file, how is it? The way that he did it is he just took the upper chunk of the page and then stuck it as a header. It, the best way is not to really put it this way, just like have a only this part as a header and we will go through another website now I have that will be much more organized. I just want to show this as the default. Uh, so what will happen is the about.html, it uses the page, page <coughs> template. It will come this template, okay, I need to build myself. Where's the header? It will go grab the header, all the contents of header and then it will inject them here as any other template works. Also the menu. And uh, here is the most inter interesting part. Content is basically the HTML page, which is about that HTML. That's the content. Whenever I say content.title, it will go grab whatever I have in the metadata. Which is, it will go to the title and it will get it. So you can define anything you want and then you can access it by content dot, and then you can put it in your uh, page. Uh, where were we? We are in the page. And uh, you can go wild with free, mar uh, free marker, um, also like with the dates and any, any string manipulation. And this is the most interesting part too, is the content dot body. Anything that comes under those six things, that's the content dot body. It will take it and it will inject it inside here between those two p. So you can write HTML, anything you want, and then it will take it and it will inject it. Now, this is a very quick overview about like how the template works, and this is the default one. Now I want to just jump directly to a website I created, and it's a bit like it's a bit more organized. I think maybe I think so. Here we have the templates, and here we go. Let's say I have the page now. So this page template, it has just, if you look at it, it's like an HTML page. And then I created a template called header. I put all the, anything in the head section of the HTML page. I put it right here. So it will be easier to maintain, like to think about it. So anything in the header, I put it here, and then it will be in injected directly between the two head, uh, uh, between the in the head and then in the body let's say if you have a title and you can put anything in the title for example here I have a div and then let me make it a bit bigger yep and then you can also inject a menu and then the content dot body you can see that anything for example here content let's say I have a portfolio that HTML anything that comes under it it will just take all of this and it will inject it in this div. And if you have a footer and then I have some H, uh, JavaScript import too. And for example, here if, um, if also if I have a controller. So this is something I just like thought about. Let's say if I want to have an HTML page and then I, I want to import a <coughs> JavaScript file in it let's say a controller for that page, I want to do something. So what I do is, let's say I have that in, where was it? It was in the content. So I tell it that in the metadata, hey content.html page, you have a controller called contact.js. Okay, it will just do nothing. Whenever it comes to the template, the template will look, do I have anything called content.js controller? In this page, the, the content.html, yes, I do have. It will take that, 
and I will replace it here with the path. So I have in the assets, controllers, I have contact.js, so it will take this content.js, which is right here, and then I will inject it inside here. So whenever it will, whenever I have the real content.html, whenever it's mixed with the template, I just, I just have it here. And any other page, for example, if I have no, there's no content that, uh, there's no JavaScript file in it, I just skip it. It will not include it. Any question till now? Okay. Let's see if we are on the right path. Yeah. Um, templates. Yeah. That should cover it. Yep. And JBake, it comes with default templates. So by default, it will give you a sitemap. It will go through all your pages, and then it will build it. It will uh, create the XML for the sitemap for you. And uh, feed also, it will create a feed.xml uh, for you and index.xml, so it's a regular uh, template, but just they call it index and it will be, con it will be converted to an index.html page. You can, con you can change all of that in the configuration if you want. Now, let's say, uh, let's go back to this website. And we will, I'll show like how did I implement the Google Analytics and how did I implement the discuss uh, comment section. show you the website first so that maybe to and the JPEG actually okay so it's there I refresh so that's the website just a very basic website some stuff in it and it has all the contents so okay and the templates uh, you can see here in the page template I have uh, Google Analytics so I'm just injecting this template right here so I'll just go to the Google Analytics it's only one place you can inject it in any, let's say, if you want Google Analytics in specific pages and not on other pages. If you want, it will just inject it. So what will happen is it will take this content and any page that uses the page.ftl template, it will inject the Google Analytics in it. Very basic and very simple. So if you want to create a very simple website, like in 15 minutes, you don't care about databases, you don't care about uh, doing crazy stuff, I found JBIC like just to be very quick, very easy to implement it. Now let's see how to implement, for example, also discuss. It will be more a bit more interesting because discuss for every page, it has a token so that it can identify which page it's uh, commenting for. Usually by default, it will take the uh, website URL, but that could change and from my experience, it's not a good thing. So if you have a GUID for every page, that would be the best thing. So, we don't have any, uh, let's create it actually, also, I have a control one, but let's create it now. So let's see, I want to, a new file, and let's create something called discuss, discuss.ftl. So that will be our template. I'll save it, it will add. Okay. That will be our template and come back here. And I have our little small discuss.html. Uh, discuss, just it will tell you in every page you want to have comments, inject 
this HTML and JavaScript in it in every single page. So I'm going to tell it, OK, so the template will have it, no problem. And then you can see that the discuss identifier, it, will, it should be unique for every single page. <coughs> so what should I do? So I tell it, OK, you have this template. Discuss identifier, every page will be responsible for providing its GUID. So every page, it should uh, define something called, let's say I call it discuss identifier. And then whenever it will build it with this template, it will inject it inside this. It will just a string replacement. So let's go ahead and see one page that do that, portfolio. And actually, before portfolio, let me go to the page and see how we are integrating the um, discuss. So I'm telling it, I want to inject this HTML and JavaScript right here. I'm telling it, hey, if you have discuss, it's not null, it's defined. And the discuss enabled, there's a flag that I created, it's true. And the content and the content dot discuss identifier, it's really filled, then include this template. So at least whenever I display it, I'm confident enough that there's something, there's some identifier for discuss. So for example, portfolio, I define discuss enable yes, true. And discuss identifier, I have a GUID. What will happen whenever, and this one is using page template. It will go and find page template, all those are, um, are met, all those uh, uh, conditions are met, so it will go to the discuss.ftl and tell it, hey, I have this GUID that I gave it right here. Please inject it right here. So if I go and if I go to the portfolio and it's actually a different one right now, but no problem. serve it to see it. So refresh it. Oh, good. So I go to the portfolio I, and I would expect a comment section at the bottom. And I don't. So I refresh and I don't. As usual. For some reason. Oh, because I'm in the wrong folder. That's why. Presentation <coughs> and I change directly to archive. JPEG control test. Nice. JPEG. Move that nice. JPEG dash s. Cool. So I refresh. Okay, it took some time, so probably this guy is here. Perfect. Here we go. It's live. And, for example, if we go back, let's say contact, I tell it I don't, I don't define anything. So it will not put any, it will not inject any JavaScript in it. Very basic, just you can have a website with comments and let's say Google Analytics in 15 minutes, ready and then all glued up if you want. And we'll talk about hosting in a second. All static, I and out of the box. So you can see here, and then for example, I have this one too. It has discuss why? Because it's the moral painting. So if I go to the more wall moral painting, I have defined it with a grid, with true, it will inject it, everything for you. Uh, so that's uh, that's for for this one, for example. Yeah. Let me see. Do I need to cover anything else here? You can create definitely your own custom templates. Page it comes by default, but you can create any template you want. 
Um, and there's something called data model. Uh, inside, whenever we say content.body or content dot any of the metadata that we have defined, you can, those are the, by default defined too. You can get all of them if you're interested. You can get all the pages that you have, all the posts, and you can get them in the list with free, free marker. You can, let's say, have a page that have all your posts or your blogs or your pages. Um, if you want to use JBake, it's also available in the Maven Central repo. And it has a Maven plugin and a beta plugin. And we have integrated Google Analytics with Discuss. So you can see like, even like in less than 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you can create a very quick one. Okay, any questions till now? Okay, I'll continue. Okay, so I'll show, I'll just talk a bit now about a website I, um, I've been working on and how did I use JBake um, to make like a semi-medium sized website and how did I glue it all together? Uh, anybody, uh, does anyone know like Open Data? Canada Open Data, what is it? Anybody doesn't know? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> perfect, okay, that's good. That uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, the Canadian government, um, they publish data. Every ministry on the federal and on the provincial level, uh, they have, they publish data. Uh, if you want to use it, you can go ahead. There's a website for that, uh, even at the municipal level. So it covers education, uh, healthcare, any any mystery that you can think of. So I was I'm interested like in this kind of stuff. So I just took this data and let me see what can I do with it. Just create a website just to aggregate it, present it, and see what will uh, what could if it would be useful for. So I'll just show you the website in a second. And all this website is using JBake. And all is static, there's no database, there's nothing. All static files being served. So let's see here, I will go, let's say, okay, let's say here. Here, let's say, for example, I'm pulling all the average, uh, the Canadian city's average rent prices from 1987 till 2014. So let's say if I wanna go to, let's say Vancouver, it will show me from 1987 all the uh, um, apartments unit from bachelor to three bedrooms. And I can see it in a graph. And let's see anything, uh, London, Ontario, let's say. It will go and get it. All is static, there's no database behind it. And I'll talk it in a second just the way I did it. That's really cheap for three bedrooms. Are you sure about that? Uh, <laughs> it's, they call it the average. <laughs> Actually, I lived, I lived in London. So there's some cheaper than that? That's three bedroom? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, check Toronto. I'm pretty sure it'll be triple. Yeah, okay, fine. But <laughs> that's mm. London. Yeah, oh, yeah that's, that's London. London. Oh, that's Nobody, Nobody wants to live in London. I mean, come on. No further, I, uh, no further questions. I always know, I sh whenever I show this one, I show um, <laughs> Fort, um, Fort McMary in Alberta. Yeah. And you can, <laughs> and you can see whenever the oil price just whenever oil just came in, you can see the jump in the prices like in two thousand eight. Uh, oh yeah, Toronto. It's a bit uh, tricky because they combine all the GTA actually, oh, yeah. which is almost calm. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Fourteen thirty seven. That's still cheap. Yeah. Like I said, some of the data publishes even true. That's cheap. Yep. Let's say. Let's say if you wanna. Let's say I have also universities. Let's say if you wanna. If you wanna find in 2012-2013 on the theory will all the computer science students went to which university. You can go and then get it, which is not surprising. Uh, computers, let's say, I want to find uh, software. Uh, software. There's no software engineer. Oh, yeah, computer. Computer science. I don't think there's computer engineer. Mm. Mathematics. Mathematics. Oh, that I found it. Waterloo. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. 
yeah. comp side program is underneath the math department. So. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> okay, cool. So all this website is hosted on GitHub for free and it's all static and with JBake. So I was Wait, okay. How much, how much is the hosting? Free. Nothing. Oh, how do you do that? GH <laughs> pages. <laughs> yep. So what I did, I was, uh, okay, so I want to glue all that website together, let me use JBake. But I have all those, ap like, all this data that I don't want to load at the same time. So I need just to do an Ajax call somewhere. I can do it like to a server, like to an API layer, and I want to pay money somewhere. Okay, let me not just do that for a prototype. Let me have a static database, I call it. So what I, it's, this is a JBIG site and the uh, assets. I created an Ajax and I call a folder data and all this, for example, let's say housing, rent. I created all those oh. JSON files. And then for example, if I wanna go for uh, Barry Ontario, I just, whenever somebody types Barry Ontario, it will just go get, uh, grab the JSON file from there. Simple, easy, one step, and very quick. I'm just utilizing GitHub CDM for free. Uh, anybody can hit it. The first day I posted it web this website, 5,000 people hit it, unique people, in one day. It was the average response was 20 milliseconds. Not bad for free. Wait, tell us, tell us what you mean by using the GitHub CDM for free. Because that's cool. Okay. That's definitely cool, yeah. So, uh, uh, have any, you know GitHub Pages? Okay, so GitHub Pages, it will allow you to create a, a website, let's say. Uh, for example, let's see, go here. Uh, GitHub, so that's, yeah. Cool. So if you have a GitHub, Oops. If you have any GitHub account, if you create any repo with your username .github.io and then you go visit that, let's say that's my username. It will display whatever you have in your repo. So if in your repo you have a website structure, it will be a website. Now, this one is redirecting to my domain name because I made it, they will allow you to do that. But if I didn't have it, it will say jamlo.github.io. So what it's doing is it's serving all your static files using GitHub pages and utilizing all the GitHub CDN. So if anybody in the world hit it from California and China and Europe, anywhere, you're just paying nothing for it, and uh, if you think about it, Bootstrap is uh, hosted by GitHub, so the Bootstrap website. And there's a trick. Uh, there's a trick if you want to see if a website just, I usually like, you can get around it, but if your website is hosted by GitHub, if you go to any 404, it will, this is the GitHub 404 page. <laughs> So that's a very quick trick. Oh, okay. I'm hosted on GitHub. And all this is static. Now you can have an API. I'll just talk about it either. Actually, I'll talk about it now. If you want to have all your HTML hosted on GitHub, and you, if you want to do API calls, you'll be hit by the uh, same origin policy. So you can get away with that just either using JSON, uh, JSON P or course very easily. And with Spring, you can have course in one line which is the, uh, I forgot what is it, but it will allow you to, to do Ajax call into your server if it's coming out from a domain that is not the one that is serving the HTML. If I said that right, probably, yep. Um, yep, so what, uh, just a quick thing here. 
So what I have is on the server itself, on GitHub, so imagine all of this is GitHub. I have all the HTML, and I call it the API, but the API is nothing but this data, this JSON. And then I have it. I have a MongoDB just behind the scene locally, and if I want to generate anything I want in any shape, I just generate it. I have a small Java program generated, spit it into this static folder structure, and just be the, just very quick, and then post it, just commit it to GitHub, and it's available instantly. Um, this is the local DB, and uh, basically, basically that's it. So using JBIG, you can, if you want, just go very quick. I want to create a website just for somebody I know. Quick, in 15 minutes, add Google Analytics, add comments for free, just pay for the domain name, use GitHub pages. Very quick, or if you don't care about GitHub, you can just take all those static files, dump them somewhere on a server, and then put, uh, for example, Cloud Cloudflare in front of it, the cache system, and you have it for free, I guess, maybe the first. Yeah, they have a sub. S3 bucket? Yeah, or an S3 bucket, yeah. Um, this is like, I thought that I would like to share with it. So this website, it seems a bit like it's maybe like big and all like complex and all this API calls and what's happening, but I try to keep it simple. Whatever works, makes sense, just... So just copy the output folder? Exactly. I just copy the output folder and then put it, and it will be available. Uh, Right. Yep. My favorite thing about what you've done here is that you've got effectively a database that the web page is querying. <laughs> and somebody in Australia who's looking at this website will get answers back faster than the most expensive MongoDB. <laughs> <laughs> because they'll get an answer back faster than light can travel from Australia to the United States and back again. <laughs> And you zero. That's true. Well, that's what Mongo is using. <laughs> so you pay for the, the fastest database ever, whatever it is, and it's useless. And this is this will beat it. This is free because the data is actually in Australia when the person asks for it. This is like a test. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks. So yep, basically, basically, that's it. Um, so, how, so how much is your? How much can you store on GitHub? Uh, actually, I'm pushing it to the limit. Are you? Yeah. Oh, there's a limit. <laughs> no, actually, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It's. It's. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so because uh, let me show you actually this website, the one that I, it's actually online. It's for, it's for someone I know. They're an artist, actually. And innovation.ca. So that's on GitHub. That's what I was showing you. And let's say portfolio. And. So this is not violating any terms of use or anything? Nothing. They, they actually, it's nice. Like uh, on the GitHub pages, they will tell you just go wild. <laughs> exactly. I was like, okay. That's pretty good yeah. use. <laughs> I remember you said that. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, here, like, there's a PDF 15 megabytes, there's one 33 megabytes, and there's one 27. I tried uploading one 80, and it just didn't complain, just it will. Okay, I just commit it, push it, it just worked. <laughs> if you think about the size of the projects that are hosted on GitHub, you're a drop in the bucket. Like That's true. Yeah. The amount of data that you're uploading is nothing. How, how does GitHub make money with this stuff? Yeah. That's how do they make money? Maybe private repos? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because many companies, they use them. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, private repos. The, the last four companies I've worked at have used GitHub private repos for their, for their hosting. Mm -hmm. and it I, just makes sense. I mean, the amount of time you spend maintaining your, Git, your own Git repo. And you don't get a web interface, and you don't get uh, distribution, and you have to worry about 
you know, VPNs for people who are at home and whatever else. Yeah. You can just buy the for There's like an enterprise installed locally yep. version for like five or ten grand, something yep. like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Actually, if, if many companies, they don't want to host it online, yeah. they can just host it their own GitHub version. Yeah, you can look at the prices of the prices on CloudFront if you want to pay somebody for a CDN. Have all your secrets. Yeah. Oh, right. CloudFront? Uh, I've never tried it. It's not bad. It's not bad. Is it CloudFlare? Yeah, for example, I think I usually use this guy. I use usually, what is it, features. I'm not sure where is the plans. oh plans. Yeah, features plans on the right. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so I usually use this one <laughs> if I'm not hosting <laughs> on GitHub. Uh, exactly. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> but imagine yourself whenever you use GitHub pages, you're using let's say a business plan for free. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm I'm trying now to like to uh, to have like custom APIs, so I want just to have uh, still my website hosted on GitHub, but just have custom APIs, and it seems to be like very manageable with JSONP or course, very manageable. Yeah, so that's it. Any questions? Any comments? Cool. Thanks, everyone. Great.